Uh, this, is in, this session is inspired by a paper uh, we are uh, developing with Federica on uh, IoT, Internet of Things, and uh, regional characteristics in relation to the IoT. To discuss the topic a bit more further than the IoT regional, and regional economies, we have invited a number of people and today we will have a very long session in terms of content not in terms of time and the order of the appearance are the following we have federica dr F dr federica rossi uh, and she will illustrate you know her well uh, she she will illustrate the, the content of the paper that we are working on and the working paper is published on the center uh, working paper list then we have our guest. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of um, lot of very nice content and very nice insights from three uh, prestigious guests. I would say uh, one is Pierre Yves Danet from Orange, and uh, she will he will talk about be the digital innovation hubs is something that is uh, developing quite well in uh, in 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 the EU member states. Then we have uh, Professor David Langley from University of Groningen TNO. And uh, his presentation I saw has a very a, a lot of nice ideas. So the, the title he gave is the same title of the uh, of the session here. So he will discuss various angles on digital transformation and regional economies. And then Brian McCauley from Digital Catapult. Uh, also, you know quite well what Digital Catapult is. He will give us a brief view on what Digital Capital, Catapult does in on the session. We will close. Uh, the one hour with the head of the center, Professor Helen Otto Smith, we, and uh, and really without any further ado, I'm passing the audience to Federica. Federica, if you are ready, I'm going to mute you. Just tell me when to move the slides, and I will move them. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Saverio, and thank you very much to everyone who's joining us today. So, um, yeah, so we, we're going to present a study that we uh, have done uh, in the last, uh, we started a couple of years ago, actually, with this, with this work, um, trying to map uh, IoT competences across European regions. It was done on the, on the back of another project where we started, uh, we were looking at uh, uh, the innovation intermediaries uh, supporting uh, development of IoT technologies, and then we decided to move into this mapping exercise. And it's a project that uh, um, involves myself, but also Saverio, as well as some other colleagues in Italy, Margherita Russo, Annalisa Caloffi, and Pasquale Pavone, and the colleague in France, Anna Kolovic. Uh, so the objectives of the research uh, are to, uh, next slide, Saverio, please, are to look at what are the prevailing IoT competences in different regions and based on these competences to try and understand which regions have the greatest potential for further expansion of their IoT capabilities. And we try to do this mapping at regional level for 18 European countries using an original methodology, which I'm going to try and describe briefly in the next few slides. So why do we want to do this competence mapping? Uh, next slide, please, Saverio. Um, we want to do it because we think it is interesting to try and identify which regions have the potential for further expansion of technological capabilities related to IoT. IoT is an enabling technology, so it's a technology which can enable you know, the development of further technologies and can support a lot of innovation, right, on, 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 on the back of this platform. So it's, it's a technology with a lot of potential. So it is interesting to try and understand which regions might have an advantage, for example, you know, the, the, might have the competences that enable them to then further build on this technology. Um, it is complicated to do this mapping. IoT is a complex technology, bundles of technology and application not always detected by patent data. So if you do a mapping of the patents, well, you might understand who is doing research on IoT, where the knowledge is being developed, but you don't really get a sense of all the competences around the development of this technology. Relying purely on codes of economic activity is also limiting because these codes tend to be a little bit outdated. So we need innovative approaches and we are proposing one which we're going to show you uh, soon and this approach still relies on using codes of economic activity but uh, in, in a more sophisticated way than simply just relying on those codes 
It's interesting to map competences because, you know, tech, regional competences are important if you want to, you know, if you want to develop, if you want to attract companies, for example, in a certain, in a certain technological area. A lot of it will depend on what competences are already there, you know, if you want to attract investment, for example. We also make an argument when we decide to look at which regions we think have the greatest potential for uh, IoT development, we make an argument that the greater variety of competences in the region around IoT. Know, the uh, sorry, there is a background noise. Uh, thanks. Um, the greater variety of IoT competence in the region increases opportunities for further technological development. So the more competencies you already have, the more likely you are to be able to have further technological development around IoT in the future. And this argument builds on a, on a, on a, number, of, uh, um, on a number of reasons. One is that the technological competences in the core elements of the technology are like building blocks, you know, and you can use them to further make technological advances around, along the same technological trajectory. You can further diversify into related technology. You're more likely to discover new technological applications. So having all these different building blocks can give you an advantage for the future. There is also an argument that the more, the larger the variety of technological competences around IoT, the less likely you are to be um, sort of shut off by of further technological development. Should you know the, the innovation opportunities migrate along the value chain? So if you are covering the whole value chain, then you are less likely to be to become obsolete on, or cut off from technological development. And so on. So we have a number of reasons to argue that the, the greater the variety of competencies, the better for technological development. Next slide, please, Saverio. I'm going to go quickly over this one because this is about the technical structure of, you know, IoT systems, which are very complex. Um, and basically, you know, the, the key element to take away from here is that the IoT system have got many layers and uh, perhaps the key ones have to do with hardware on one level, with the connectivity level, which has to do with telecommunication, and with the software level, which is the IoT platform, and all the applications on top of it. Um, let's just move on to the next slide. So I'm just going to go quickly into the mapping exercise that we've done now. Um, we use, first of all, data uh, from a database called Amadeus, which uh, includes uh, information about a very, very large amount of companies in 18 European countries. So we selected all companies in 28 sectors that, according to an IoT expert, are likely to be related to IoT. We extracted in this way 206,356 companies in 18 countries, and we ex extracted a number of variables about these companies, the identifier, name, location, the size, the website address, the legal form, and the NACE codes. Then we exploited another information that is present in the Amadeus database, which is the full overview field. This is a text which describes the activities of the company, and it is derived from a web scraping procedure. So this full IoT, full overview field is only available for 17,000 companies, so just for a sample of these companies. So what have we done in order to use the information from this full overview field to classify companies, but uh, extrapolate it to the whole uh, sample rather than just to the 17,000 for which it was available. Well, we've done the following. Next slide, please, Saverio. Uh, sorry, that was just a picture of the um, distribution of the companies by country. So next one, thanks. Um, so we have done a text mining of the full overview fields. And we have identified what are the, um, we have associated all the NACE codes to their characteristic terms. So for each of the NACE codes, which are the terms that characterize them according to the full overview field. Then we have grouped the NACE codes according to their similarity. So how similar are the NACE codes in terms of the description of economic activities corresponding to these NACE codes? We've done a clustering to do this, and we have, we have ended up with a number of clusters. A number of these are related to IoT, so we call them IoT domains. In particular, five clusters are strongly related to IoT themes. So we um, associate 
So we basically argue that the, the NACE codes associated with these clusters are NACE codes that relate to IoT related activities. Once we've got these uh, clusters of NACE codes, we are then able to associate the companies to these clusters and to, um, to measure how many companies in each region belong to each of these clusters of uh, uh, NACE codes. So it gives us an idea, it gives us a way to reclassify companies on the basis of uh, their activities related to IoT. Finally, once we've done this, we have also clustered the regions to identify which regions have similar profiles of competences based on the companies that are based in those regions. I'm going to show you the next slide, which probably gives you a little bit of a clearer idea of what we've done. So basically, see what we've been able to do is, thanks to the text mining, we have been able to identify characteristic terms which are associated to certain groups of NACE codes. So, for example, you can see in the top line, we find that the NACE codes in the right-hand column are associated with terms like software, computer data processing, information technology, and so on. So, we think that these are codes that relate to software and data processing. We then have a bunch of codes that relate to communication, telecommunications. We have a bunch of codes that relate to manufacturing of telecommunication equipment. We have a bunch of codes that relate to manufacturing of electronic components. And finally, a bunch of NACE codes that relate to the manufacturing of measurement instruments. And these all have to do with IoT, because these are all components that you need to have an IoT system. So once we've reclassified companies according to the IoT domain they belong to, and we measured how many companies there are in each region in each of these categories, we are able to do a mapping of what is present in those regions. So if you show the next slide, Saverio, so you can see what we've obtained, okay? What have we done? Well, we've, we've, we've got a clusters of regions, right? Regions which have similar profiles of competences. In particular, the blue regions are regions where the majority, the main profile of the company is having companies in software services. The purple ones have mainly to do with telecommunications. And then we've got the, the red ones that mainly to do with hardware. And then we've got clusters where we have combinations like telecoms and hardware, um, hardware with some software, hardware, software, and telecoms, and hardware and software. Okay. So what do we see from this picture? First of all, um, we notice that uh, um, the, there are, the, the size of the dots is proportional to the number of companies. And you can see that the regions with the largest dots, uh, uh, well, you, you see some interesting things, like, for example, there's a big, there is a large dot over Dublin, there is a large dot over Barcelona, Madrid, you know, so some of the capital cities have got these agglomerations of companies. The ones with the largest dots tend to have agglomeration of software companies, because these are generally small companies, so you have many of them, right? So you have big dots because there are lots of software, small software companies in those regions. Then you have areas where you might have uh, you know, smaller dots because the companies are larger. So there are fewer companies, but actually perhaps in terms of employment, there might be bigger. You know, if you just count the number of companies, small, larger companies might not be as many as small ones. Another interesting uh, thing to observe is that uh, some regions are more uh, homogeneous and some regions are more heterogeneous in terms of clusters. So some regions have almost entirely belong to one cluster. Uh, sorry, some countries almost entirely belong to one cluster, whereas some other cl countries have uh, regions in a mix of clusters. And typically, the more central regions tend to be more heterogeneous. So you have regions belonging to a mix of clusters, and the more peripheral regions tend to have uh, more homogeneous profiles. So if you show the next slide, we're going to go a bit more into this. I'll try and be brief because we only have a couple of minutes. So when you look at uh, how many of the companies in the country belong to a certain cluster, you will find that there are a number of countries where the majority of the companies are all in the same cluster. So for example, um, you know, all the countries here at the top are countries with companies almost entirely included in the first cluster region, the one with the software companies. Ireland and Spain have most of their companies included in the cluster B, which is characterized by having many telecom companies. 
Uh, then you have a cluster which has to do with hardware, and then you can find, you know, that this has got a lot of companies from Italy, and then some France, some Germany, but mainly, well, a lot of Italian companies are in the cluster. And then you have the more diversified clusters, which tend to be um, a mix. You know, you have to have a lot, you have a lot of companies in, in it's basically the larger European regions and countries, so the UK, France, Germany, and Italy, they tend to be spread across um, various clusters rather than, than concentrating in a single one. The next slide shows the importance of each country in each cluster. So it's a slightly different index. And what we see here is that uh, the more specialized clusters, um, such as software services or telecoms, um, see a mix of countries. Okay, well, In fact, the telecoms we see mainly Spain and for a smaller share, Ireland. But this is to do with the size, the relative sizes of the country, right? Because yeah, uh, the number of companies in the two countries will be quite different. Um, hardware is mainly Italy, the hardware cluster D, and then the other clusters which are more diversified, they tend to be a mix of UK, France, Germany, and to a smaller extent, Italy. So these more diversified clusters see a mix, um, a mix uh, uh, of these larger countries be be being present there, really. Um, so what do we say in terms of potential for IoT development, if we go to the next slide, you can see that we basically looked at regions um, in terms of how diversified are their competences. So are they regions where there is an entire IoT value chain? Are there regions where there are po portions of the value chain? Or are there regions where there is just one component of the value chain? Okay, so so how do we classify them? And we find that according to our mapping, um, really you find diversified IoT competences only in regions, um, mainly in regions of the UK, France, and Germany. Uh, partially diversified IoT companies you find, in find again in regions of the UK, Germany, Italy, and France. And then Specialized IoT companies are generally found in uh, uh, in the other countries. Okay, so it's uh, in Italy as well. So you find a bit of a differentiation where larger countries tend to have uh, sort of regions which more integrated value chain, and smaller, more peripheral countries tend to have regions with more specialized elements of the value chain. Um, when we do Further, um, and so so the, so there is an interesting profile there. We also notice that uh, um, when we look at the actual profile of these regions, um, and this is going to I'm going to stop here after this. I think we find that the full value chain tends to be present in densely populated urban, often capital regions, so typically London, the region around Paris. We also find a lot of the more manufacturing uh, sort of uh, regions in Germany also tend to have this profile. Um, whereas uh, um, more peripheral regions, again, as I said, tend to have more specialized um, component of value chain. And to finish with, we also find some evidence that regional competences build on the knowledge base of the region. So the, traditionally, the countries which have specialization in manufacturing will be specialized in IoT hardware, and countries where there is high employment in advanced services will tend to specialize in IoT software, basically in connectivity. But this is not extremely surprising. OK, I'm going to stop there because lots of data. <laughs> Thank you, Federica. Uh, thank you also for the time. Uh, we will have a bit of questions at the end. Pierre, if you are ready, yes, tell me when I'm to ready. move the slides and I'll move the slide. Okay. Uh, I will go mute. OK, okay fine. Uh, thank you, Saverio. Thank you all. Uh, so yes, I, I will try to, to make a, a short presentation of the Smart Connectivity Digital, Digital Innovation Hubs Network which is an uh, um, uh, um, initiative so, uh, so supported by the 6G uh, Smart Network and Services uh, Industry Association, as well as the Alliance uh, for Internet of Things and Innovation. So next slide, please. 
Well, uh, I don't know if you know. So this uh, initiative from the Commission, uh, which has uh, which has started uh, in April 2016, and with the objective, you know, to to facilitate uh, adoption of digital technologies in uh, in European industry. Uh, showing that you know, uh, co considering a number of uh, of countries, uh, so the, the the level of uh, digitalization is not the same, and uh, so the the idea of the Commission is really to push and boost, uh, so the use the usage of digital technologies in um, uh, in process uh, and in organization of uh, industry, and. Uh, uh, so the, the plan that has been put in place, so I've identified four uh, pillars, and one of them is to develop the digital innovation hubs, which are regional or local organization, which are uh, supported, uh, so digitalization of uh, industry, whatever they are, in agriculture, in health, uh, in so manufacturing, uh, so, uh, so any, any types of, uh, uh, of verticals, I would say. So next slide. So looking to that, uh, so uh, following this uh, this first uh, uh, so initiative, so there will be you know this uh, this new program, the, the Digital Europe program, which has been started so last year, 2021 to 27, which is there you know to found uh, a number of uh, of uh, of domain of project which are uh, trying to facilitate the digitalization in terms of cyber security, artificial intelligence, uh, HPC, but also connectivity and so on. And one of the of the topic is uh, digital innovation apps, uh, which are so these uh, these entities, the local entities that I told, told you, which are uh, co-funded by the European Commission and so each member state, uh, which are also the interest, you know, to to use and to uh, to, to 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 boost so adoption of digital technologies. So next slide, please. So looking to that, um, so th there was. Initially, two uh, two um, so uh, uh, parallel initiatives, you know, one conducted by the AIoti on IoT, and one from the 5G AI, uh, so which was the previous you know, 6G AI, uh, which was uh, which was the association in charge of the 5G uh, partnership. Uh, and so the idea, uh, so the initial idea of these two uh, so uh, uh, association was to identify uh, which DAHs are um, so uh, covering so the smart connectivity, so IoT and 5G. And uh, so following some, some months or some meetings, so we discover that most of the DIH uh, uh, that has been identified are covering both uh, 5G and IoT. And it's why so we, we, so the two associations so, uh, so merge the two initiatives into one uh, in order to, you know, to have a greater impact and uh, so be known as a lighthouse network of uh, DIH addressing so, uh, so the smart connectivity, which are encompassing so 5G, so, uh, so network, IoT, uh, AI and cybersecurity. And so the name is a Smart Connectivity DH Networks Codinet, and it's uh, already so put in place and running. So next slide, please. Well, just to explain you, you know, there, are, there will be you know services which are which are uh, below, uh, which are offering by the DIH themselves, so Smart Connectivity DIH at regional level. So they are more or less you know uh, providing some support of the local industry to uh, to understand the need and to develop some solution. Uh, and there is a Scodinet uh, service at the network level, which is there, you know, to, uh, to, to, to provide some services which are common to all uh, DIH and that where we can share some good practices, but also find some funds, uh, fund, uh, so opportunity and, and so on, uh, over offering some tools and so on in order to facilitate uh, so the, the life of the, of the DIH themselves. Next slides, please. Um, so uh, yes, uh, looking to the digital innovation, uh, the, uh, digital sorry, uh, European program. Uh, so the Commission is funding so DIH as I told you, but also what they call a DTA, the Digital Transformation Accelerator, which is there, you know, to um, uh, to to coordinate all the the, the activities of uh, of the sub network of DIH. Scodinet is one of the sub networks. There are several other sub networks uh, addressing verticals or, or other other technologies, and the DTA is somewhere, you know, the umbrella which is there, you know, to, to meta coordinate all the, the, the process. And so this um, 
DTA will be uh, so selected uh, through a code or procurement in, so in the following months. And uh, so, so uh, Scodinet is one of the partners of this DTA. Next slide, please. Just to uh, remind you, so, so the services that are provided by Scodinet, so these are uh, five main activities. One is marketplace catalog, where people could find a number of information. Policy activity, try you know, to, to, uh, to support the liaison with European Commission. Uh, best practices and steel and skills, so that's training, uh, so uh, so webinar and so on, and support function with co collaborative tools uh, and uh, identification and farms and so on. You know, that's more or less the main services that the Scodinet uh, will offer to DIHs. Next slide. I guess it's one one. Yeah, just so, so the main achievement that we have since the beginning of this initiative. So we are uh, 83 members, so 83 DIHs uh, among uh, so Europe, which is quite good, covering most of the countries. And uh, so the main point is that we uh, we tried uh, you know to identify the, so the verticals which are covered by DIH, and it's quite important to show that uh, so we have addressing mainly you know manufacturing, agriculture, health. Um, and um, so other uh, so mobility uh, so um, uh, mobility verticals. Another thing is that we have a number of liaison with other initiatives, so that you see there, as Gaia X, uh, Living in Euro, which is Smart City, uh, European Enterprise Network, and also uh, DIH for Industry and Digitalogic, which is uh, encompassing African DIH. And in order to support the activity of DIH, we have uh, launched or participated to the, what we call the replicability initiative, which is the idea is to reuse as much as possible the result of projects which are funded by the Commission in IoT, in 5G, in next generation internet solution, in order to, to, to help them, you know, to, to build a solution for their, uh, for their, uh, their own uh, so members and customers. So that's more or less, you know, what I would like to share with you very quickly. Uh, so that's end my 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 talk, and obviously, so I'm ready to answer to any question. Thank you, Sergio. Yeah, you are fantastic. Seven minutes exactly. Uh, okay, <laughs> let's go to the next one. Uh, we have some additional slides for you, David. Please, it's your time. Seven, eight minutes for you too. Thanks very much, uh, Severio, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is David Langley. I work here in the Netherlands in the lovely city of Groningen in the north. And Severio asked me to uh, tell you something about the work I do at the AIOTI, the Alliance for Internet of Things Innovation, which is relevant to this work, um, which uh, you guys and, and um, has just been explained. Um, but I also want to take the opportunity to tell you about some things, relevant things I do at my two other um, affiliations at TNO, which is an Applied Research Institute in the Netherlands uh, and the University of Groningen here. So I'm going to do like two minutes on each one. <laughs> Let's see how we get on. David. You are mute, David. David, you are muted, I think. Oh, sorry, I pushed the button yeah. by mistake. Uh, so the AIOTI is the leading business alliance with a couple of hundred members. Um, looking at all different layers in the in the AO, uh, IoT ecosystem, and it's really it's um, leading the way in negotiating and um, um, trying to inspire the European Commission, and on these three key areas: thought leadership, collaboration, and matchmaking. So have a look at the website, and I think you'll find some really interesting working groups. Uh, next slide, please. Not least, uh, the working group which I chair, which is called Innovation Ecosystems, and of course looking at these regional economies and the way that um, data is used to to uh, to enhance uh, regional economies, then innovation ecosystems are key. And this is a, a scheme which we have developed uh, in my uh, working group, showing the, the role of uh, large scale pilots, such as uh, projects which are carried out um, uh, with uh, different technology firms uh, uh, small medium enterprises and end users, but there's many other uh, stakeholders and there's an infrastructure. So uh, next slide, please. Um, and much, much of it is driven by the European data strategy, which is focused around federated data spaces, which you've probably heard about, probably are involved in. 
But if you don't, if you're not, then I really suggest you look them up because it's going to be the basis for many developments in Europe based upon these values. And things like digital sovereignty, uh, interoperability are very different to the way our digital solutions are working at the moment. Next slide, please. At the AIOTI, we have a lot of knowledge on various aspects of the ecosystem. Here's an example of some uh, more detail on what is the edge, uh, the far edge, the deep edge, and uh, so forth. Different uh, roles in the ecosystem uh, play a, um, a different function at these different levels of edge computing. So it's good to understand them and it's good to make use of this. Next slide, please. At the AAOTI, we have a strategic research and innovation agenda, which covers many, many topics. And you can really say it's converging around uh, the cognitive cloud. And that's why this uh, scheme shows a few interesting topics. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, the European strategy is also based on legislation. So there's a number of legislative uh, developments, uh, not least uh, the new uh, Data Act, which is coming into force. Uh, I think it's planned for this quarter to ensure fairness in the allocation of data value among the actors in the data economy. So this is a, a whole series of, uh, of developments at, legislative, at the legislative level. Next slide, please. Well, I'm also at TNO, this applied research organization in the Department of Strategic Business Analysis. And there we're also attacking this problem from the very applied position. Next slide, please. So working together with the uh, Netherlands AI Coalition, I've um, joined forces with InnoPay, another organization, to look at the AI ecosystem and do a market analysis. Next slide, please. So in the Netherlands, you can see quite a, a large development of initiatives for data sharing, which could be used for AI. And you can certainly see that in the last few years, this has been growing. And so we're still diverging and looking at how to carry out um, good ways of data sharing. Next slide, please. And if we zoom in on a few of the most relevant ones, uh, you can click one more time, Severio, then you'll see that, for example, Fireware and IDS cover many of the, uh, the characteristics or the challenges for data sharing. But no single initiative really um, provides the perfect solution yet. So we're learning from each other as we go. Next slide, please. And finally, I'm working at the University of Groningen, where I'm more involved in academic research. Uh, next slide, please. So one example is when we're looking at digital business models and the notion of smartness, which is very much related to IoT technologies and AI. And we've um, defined smartness on two dimensions, uh, horizontally looking at the capabilities of smart things from reactive, adaptive through autonomous to collaborative. And on the other dimension, vertically, the level of connectivity, whether things are in a closed system or in an open system, um, which is restricted or in a completely interoperable open system. And then you see that smartness really does affect business models, uh, leading from um, more simple current business models through to completely fluid and flexible business models, which can react real time to many changes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and uh, to this year, I'm going to be chairing a session at a conference on digital knowledge engineering for strategy development. And my theme is on the societal implications, particularly on orchestrating the transition to a smart circular economy. Next slide, please. So the sustainability and the regional economy are highly uh, connected. And if we look at the sustainable development goal number 12, it's all about responsible consumption and production. Next slide, please. And of course, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has already come up with the notion of the circular economy to close loops of materials and energy so that we don't um, we don't use up resources unnecessarily. But what's this got to do with the IoT, you might say? Well, next slide, please, Severio. I believe that there is no possibility of implementing the circular economy without the IoT, because we need digitalization to understand how flows of materials and energy are working and to uh, implement data spaces so that different organizations are able to connect to each other and to share uh, resources. So in this um, 
a session at the conference in April. I'm going to be trying to figure out uh, with the participants um, what the next step is in our knowledge de development for uh, a smart circular economy. And the final slide then, please, Saverio. If you want to get in touch with me on any of these topics, please, here's my email address. I've been extremely uh, brief on uh, various topics, so I hope that it's come across uh, clearly. Thanks very much. Sorry, uh, I had some problems with, uh, with my screen. Thank you, David. Uh, Brian. Uh, thank you, Sererio. Um, I can't see the slides. I don't know. Um... Can you see it? Can you see? No. I'm. I've just got. A no, we can't see it. Hold on. No, no. <laughs> I haven't stopped my stopwatch yet, so you're okay. Uh, um, now, now it's my fault. Now, can you see it? Yes, I can. Thank you. Give me a second. Okay. Thank you. OK, uh, well, you can move on to the next slide. Um, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to to participate in this discussion. Um, so I'm Brian McCauley. I'm the lead economist here at Digital Catapult. Um, so Digital Catapult is one of nine catapults um, created to um, enable um, companies and universities and policy to work together to accelerate um, and catalyze innovation and market growth. Um, this slide is uh, from a piece of work that we did last September. Um, called the Digital Futures Index, and we basically used a number of indicators and mapped um, countries by their um, degree of advanced digital um, uh, ecosystems and take up. And what we can see is that the UK, according to our index, is first across Europe, third around the world. Um, we're obviously making significant advances in advanced areas like blockchain and immersive. Um, in terms of the Internet of Things, we're, we're obviously not performing as well as that, but um, it's something that we're building on as I'll go through. Um, next slide, please. OK, so, so the goal of, of Digital Catapult is basically to accelerate um, the adoption and diffusion of advanced digital technologies. And we do this in, in three main ways. Um, we sort of break down the barriers to um, creation, innovation and adoption. Um, we de-risk the innovation and I'll show you how we or explain to you how we do those different things. And we sort of open up um, new markets. Um, so we work with a, a range of companies from early stage startups to established corporates in order to generate these um, programs. Um, next slide, please. So this, this is sort of just a schematic of, of what it is that we're doing. And, and along the bottom there, you'll see um, sort of four key technologies and, and quantum technologies as well. Those four technologies represent our technology layers as we have them in our existing strategy. So IoT falls under the um, technology layer of, of, of future networks, and that works alongside um, 5G. We have a technology layer around immersive technologies, which incorporates um, virtual reality and augmented reality and haptics. A technology layer, which is artificial intelligence and machine learning. And we have one which is distributed ledger and distributed solutions. And so we're developing a quantum technology strategy um, um, over the course of the next few months. And now, what we were doing prior to that was up until now with our strategy was to focus on those um, technologies, um, not in silos, but basically separately. But what we're doing now moving into um, the next five year strategy is to integrate these technologies into solutions. And those solutions are the virtualization of cyber physical um, cyber, cyber physical systems. So these things like virtual production in, 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 in film and TV, um, uh, digital twins, the metaverse and, and, and things like that. So this is where we're combining the immersive experience with 5G, with IoT, with artificial intelligence and coming up with these um, uh, platforms and solutions. Then we have digital resilient supply chain. So here again, using IoT distributed ledger across 5G with cybersecurity, we can build um, uh, digital supply chains, which um, obviously improves the efficiencies. Um, and then um, in the area of, of um, 5G, we're working on open and interoperable digital, digital infrastructure. And, and what we're doing here is working alongside Ofcom in order to develop a uh, standard for interoperable uh, telecommunications uh, networks and moving away from the model of a proprietary network run by uh, a telecommunications company to an open system which will allow companies to um, combine different combinations of technologies from different suppliers in different areas. Um, next slide, please. Um, and we, we sort of do these in, in sort of 
three ways. So we, we provide digital and physical facilities to allow companies to come in and experiment and, and develop and move things from um, minimum viable product proof of concept to, to prototype. Um, so we have a number of, of, of labs around the country. We have a future networks lab here. We have a 5G test bed and so forth. So we provide those facilities for companies. Um, we provide um, acceleration programs and incubation programs for companies, so mentorships or um, access to facilities such as high powered computing and training data for AI companies. And we're running a number of those programs now under an umbrella brand called Futurescope. And, and then we um, work with universities and partners and competitively won collaborative R&D projects in a number of different areas as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is sort of so while we're based, our, our centre is based in London, and if people have the opportunity to come and visit us, I would encourage it because it's a very nice centre. Um, but obviously, we we have a range of facilities and, and partnerships across um, the country. Um, the LP1 is um, a series of base stations that we've connected for IoT uh, for our things connected, um, and this is where companies can set up IoT prototypes or check data um, analytics um, free to access. So this is something which is rolled out across the country. Um, conscious of time. So next slide, please. So uh, in terms of IoT, um, until about 2019, we managed the IoT UK. And this is basically the outcome of a piece of work that was done mapping IoT companies within the UK. Um, so similar um, to, to, to Frederica's work, um, but we used a, a web scraping tool, a machine learning web scraping algorithm to identify companies by their um, uh, characteristics of their how they describe themselves on their website. And then we use data from companies house and other sources to map the um, financial position of those companies. So on the left, you'll see a screenshot of um, the uh, heat map of where these companies are based. And then on the right hand side, you'll see a sort of trend growth of a trend rate about how these companies have formed when they were formed. And we can see obviously a sort of an acceleration of IoT companies um, towards the um, 2010s uh, towards 2020. Um, next slide, please. And, and so this is as a final slide is really just um, how we're combining these different technologies. So this is a partnership we're doing with BAE Systems um, and we're building a 5G factory for the future. So this will basically have IoT sensors, 5G, AI analytics, data visualization. And the aim for BAE is to obviously improve their efficiency and productivity, to reduce the costs and accelerate production, decreasing downtime and, and issues of that, and, and demonstrate how 5G can move uh, around the issues. So um, I will leave it at that because I'm on six minutes and 45 seconds um, and hand over back. Thank you. What a diligent and great speakers I have. On average of seven minutes each. Uh, yes, uh, uh, the digital catapult building is very nice. You have a very nice view on the British Library. Go and meet Brian. We'll come and see you, uh, Brian. Um, maybe we can, uh, if I manage to come out of this, yes, maybe we can have a, a, um, we can ask our three guest speakers in order an opinion on what uh, our paper uh, is, um, is how our paper is developing. What do they think? Just a view. We can start with uh, Pierre Yves if you want. Pierre, what do you think? Well, um, I think it's very interesting because, you know, uh, they, they were in parallel this uh, smart specialization initiative conducted by the Commission. Uh, which has also you know, the, uh, the objective to identify a specialization of uh, European region regarding a number of, uh, of, uh, of topics of technologies or verticals and so on. And uh, I think it's important, you know, to uh, to, to to see that uh, another um, uh, another initiative like yours uh, could provide you no know, additional uh, information uh, so regarding the specialization of the region. And uh, for me, and from, for the Smart Connectivity Digital Innovation Hub, it's very key because we need uh, IoT uh, technologies providers uh, in order to, uh, to feed and to provide solution to uh, local users. And for DIH, it's very important you know, to, to know who are these key uh, technology providers, um, so in their region, but also out, uh, out of their region, in order to be sure that so the, so the, they are able you know, to provide to their customers a result, uh, so, so the real, the, uncover the real needs. So I, I think it's very important you know, to, to, to map uh, so, the, so our two initiatives, and I would be happy you know, to work with you in order to address this uh, specific uh, mapping. 
Fantastic, Pierre. Yeah, it would be nice to see uh, to map this, our work with the uh, digital innovation hubs uh, locations. Uh, uh, David, what do you think? What, which is your opinion, suggestions? So it's the first time I see this work that Federica just presented. So it's just the first gut reaction. Um, uh, one thing I think is perhaps a bit misleading is the numbers which are used. That I wouldn't place too much um, emphasis simply on numbers because I think, like you said, Federica, some of these companies are very small and they don't represent a great economic impact. So perhaps you could also uh, look at turnover and then and then you might find a different uh, hotspots. And I think for policymakers, of course, it's really important to know what are the characteristics of these regions? Why are some regions more advanced or more able to combine the different types of uh, relevant competences? And so it could be that there are very many similarities across regions, and it would be nice to look at the characteristics of the regions to try to uncover the underlying um, the underlying uh, substrate on which these kind of IoT ecosystems can develop. So that appears to me to be still a little unclear. Maybe I just didn't catch it. Um, and then the last point which I could make now is the notion of these um, the collaborative ecosystems. And so in a regional, um, yeah, for the regional economy, it's important that these companies really work together with their local partners. Um, and so I wonder if you can also get data on the strength of the ties between the organizations in a region. I suppose that's quite a big ask, but if you can, I would imagine that there are some regions which are much more tightly knit, which have a much denser network, whereas others are more loose. And I think that that will have probably a large effect on the kinds of innovations and the kinds of progress that they make. But those are just a couple of gut reactions. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, David. Brian, uh, uh, what do you think also in, in light of your study for the UK? Yeah, I mean, it, it was a very interesting paper. And again, I, I valued the methodology. I think what what was telling in the paper is that, again, acknowledged that when you've got these emerging advanced technologies, they're very difficult to classify according to legacy schemes. And so you do need a you do need a taxonomy, but it was good to see you mapping them onto NACE codes as a way of sort of trying to, to, to replicate that. Um, yeah, we, we too are looking towards how we might, you know, look at the, the, the ecosystem and, and place. So as part of the UK government's levelling up agenda, clearly we need to be able to see where where there is strength in, in the places with which we work. And, and certainly Echo and Pierre's point is about smart specialisation. It's not necessarily reinventing space but utilizing the strengths that these that these companies have so <clears throat> for example we have a presence in the northeast and there's an initiative there called proto which is a virtual which is a, an immersive um uh, uh, digital lab that has a number of companies that utilize that and works with the university of newcastle um to develop so um it would also, will also echo david's point about the, the the strength of the ecosystem so just having absolute numbers doesn't necessarily illustrate that the cluster is there. What's the density of relationships between the key partners uh, within those areas? And I think, you know, as with all research, this isn't an endpoint. It's the, it's the stepping stone to the next part of it. And of course, hopefully, we'll be able to help and, and, and share with you those things. Thank you, uh, Federica. Before you can maybe comment these comments, if there are some questions from the audience, if I can see them. There was a good, very interesting question in the chat. If you scroll up, uh, I have a problem in seeing it. Can, can you can you look at it? Can you? Kathleen, um, um, can you see it? No. Okay, maybe Jacqueline can ask the question um, if she's able to, um, or I'm happy to read it out. Hold on, I'm I'm loading the the, the chat. Okay. So Jacqueline is interested in, I'm, I'm, I'm going to maybe summarize, um, to understand if there are model, there is any work undertaken in IoT to ensure that there is accessibility to IoT and to ensure that no one is left behind in this and future advances of IoT. Jacqueline is the founder of the Universal Inclusion Network and of the Inclusive Entrepreneur. So is there any work done in IoT to ensure accessibility and inclusion? I, I hope I'm okay to have summarized it like this, Jacqueline, and I've not uh, simplified yes, it. That's perfect, thank you. Uh, uh, anyone has any idea? Well, Pierre, Pierre is speaking, so 
Um, honestly, so the digital innovation apps, it's a, it's a tool, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to facilitate adoption of digital technologies, and IoT technology, obviously, in any industry, but uh, also, you know, for anyone. Uh, it's not only industry, it's open to anyone. So these DIHs are uh, co-founded, as I said, between the European Commission and so the member states themselves. Because so member states are involved in order to, um, uh, to, 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 to be sure that uh, so the public money is really used for the industry, but also for, for, for public people. So uh, I think that um, uh, so, so DIH is one of the tools, not the tool, but it's one of the tools that could uh, answer the, so the, the question. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, I think there is a question from Grazia. She's, uh, your hand, Grazia, is up. If you want. Or maybe not. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Oh, hi. It's, it's not a question. It's just a point for Federica. Uh, you, Federica, you mentioned something about how the variety of IoTs in each region as an effect or opportunity for further uh, technological development. Now, I just want to mention that uh, um, years ago, I was working actually with Marion on issues related to absorptive capacity. And within that literature, there is quite a bit about the relevance of diversity and not going on all in one simple uh, sort of channel. So that, that may support your point. That's all, I, I didn't want to say anything else. Thank you. Thank you, Grazia. Uh, any, anyone else? Uh, David, please. Yeah, I'd just like to respond to Grazia's point, which I think is a really excellent uh, comment. And I think this theory will really help. And one of the key insights from the theory of absorptive capacity is that the more you have it, the more you know you need it. And the less you have it, the less you see you need it. And so you kind of get a positive feedback loop so that regions which are ahead will realize that they need to run faster than the regions that are behind. And so I think that's also going to be perhaps an interesting point that you can make in your discussion, why this enhances the relevance of your work. So I think Grazia, you've made a very important point. I will look up if, if, I, if I can go back years ago and I try to look up some of the of the papers and let you have the, the things. I think what David said is absolutely right. That's what the the absorbed capacity literature is about. You may be too ignorant to know that you are ignorant or vice versa. Well, Yes, you, you need a certain level of knowledge to be able to recognize that you are ignorant. And Thank you. Important. Okay. Thank you, Grazia. Brian, please. Well, I was reminded um, a, a report that Nesta produced in 2008 circulated again um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> so in my past life, I was the director of the Innovation Index at, at Nesta, and they did a, a piece was looking at the absorptive capacity of UK regions. Um, I was just trying to find it because it was it's there, but um, it, it was very interesting. You used the suite of data to try to um, measure the degree of absorptive capacity and adoption of new technologies. Um, and so I said it's just, just because it was we're talking about there, it's something that cropped up in a LinkedIn conversation um, about two weeks ago. And I just thought, oh, this is strange. And of course, it's come up again now. So that's just wanted to raise yeah, Yes, that. I'm aware of that. And we have considered it. I remember that one, yes. And th there are other studies as well. But obviously, there are links here between these various areas. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Grazia. Federica, do you want to comment on yeah, this? It's, uh, it's, um, it's all very interesting. Thank you very much. If I may say, um, about the um, about one one of the things that we find in well first of all one of the development of the studies to refine the methodology we're going to improve it because obviously we need to um, we need to improve uh, on 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 all elements of the methodology but uh, um, it's interesting what we find is one of the interesting thing in my view is that we find that what you have like your past competencies are really a good predictor of what you're able to do now and so for example when we talk about you know, when, when Brian presented the study on the UK and they find that the UK is really advanced in IoT competence, it's actually um, 
is actually aligned with what we find in our study as well. And most UK regions have combinations of IoT competences. And it's interesting because obviously, if you have a lot of competence in the area of software, telecommunication, etc., you can then cross fertilize in order to be able to develop new technologies. And you're in a very good position to then develop IoT and then develop, you know, other, other technologies in related fields. So, and, you know, if you are a lot of competences in manufacturing, then you will be developing a lot more of the hardware side. So I think on the one hand, there is a lot more to understand on the background. So where do these competences come from? And on the other side is that, you know, wh where the, will these competences take us? So we can look at it in a backward and in a forward looking uh, way. And I think it'd be interesting to develop a bit of both in the future. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much for for your comments for your comments uh, thank you that was really really helpful and uh, david posted the link on uh, on the yeah. on the chat without commenting so perhaps you might want to say something about it well i just think it's a really great topic and so i think that jacqueline has really uh, put a finger on a, an important thing which is often missed and so i was uh, it's not an area i know much about i just had a quick search i thought this paper looked very interesting but I don't know it, so I, di I didn't comment on it because I don't really know much about it. But I really would support the notion of, of making steps in this area. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, maybe uh, Professor Helen Lotto-Smith want to say something to close this nice hour. Helen. Yes, it's, uh, it's been a, a fantastic hour. So, so thank you to the speakers. Uh, this is an example of what we're trying to do in uh, CIMI is bring these different perspectives together. And this has been been brilliant, the, the richness of the material and the, and the insights. And to, uh, to, to borrow something that David said, that we are learning from each other. And so so thank you. Um, and something that Brian put on his, uh, his slides, which I'm borrowing from, is breaking down the barriers. So this kind of conversation, this dialogue is absolutely crucial to understanding uh, current contemporary issues and actually doing something about it unless we have the data and the insights and the conversations nothing is going to change so we we hope that in a small way we are contributing to to, to change and part of that is bringing in our uh, our audience as well our, our alumni our, our students our, our visitors uh, from different perspectives and it's all part of that that shared learning experience. So it, it's been brilliant. So so thank you, Federica and Severio, for, for pulling it all together. And it's, it's been wonderful. And thank you, Isabel, for making this happen. We're so grateful to be able to work with you and have these things happen so, so easily in a way that didn't happen before. So we are very grateful to you. So the, the internet and the uh, IT is has really benefited our lives in a, in a practical way and having the people to, to there to make it work is wonderful so so thank you everybody it's it's been absolutely brilliant thank you ellen thank you everyone is almost 59 so there's one minute left thank you to our guests for david pierre yeah. and brian for having the time federica want to say something yes go yeah, for no, I, well this is obviously the last the, um, well, first of all, I wanted to plug a guest this a special issue that I'm guest editing. Sorry, that is doing a bit of advertising. The academics among you, you might be interested in contributing to to special issues and send, sending us a, 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 an abstract. Uh, we'll have a workshop in Reims in the end of April. Um, anyway, there you go. That's the link. The other thing is this is the last uh, the last uh, seminar of the season and uh, of the of the term and. We've got something planned for next time, but I, I, I'm, I'm not up to scratch with the agenda. I don't know if Ellen has a, a link or anything to share. Um, we, can, we can share the link, but the first one is April the 27th. I think Jacqueline and I are organising ones about the role of, of universities in supporting inclusive entrepreneurship. Then the next one will be on June the 1st. We, we have a memorandum of understanding with the Kogol School of Business, the American University in DC. And we're now developing a formal collaboration with uh, Vassar University in Finland. And that debate is going to be about um, in sustainable innovation. So, and then there's further ones being planned with our colleagues in, in, in Portugal and Marian's organizing one on food standards. So we've got a lot going on, but next term it's like today's going to be international. And I think getting those 
international perspectives are, are very important. So thank you, Federica. Great. Anyone else? Any other messages? No. You are all happy. I can go back to my IoT staff. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Brian, David and Pierre for being with us and be so patient with me with all my emails and sharing the slides and all that and be so incredibly precise on seven minutes bang on. <laughs> I wish you, um, you and everyone else in this call a great afternoon and see you at the next uh, event. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Severio, uh, Federica and everybody. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.